What I'm hearing it sounds like too is that maybe there's, it's probably a lot more complex than this, but three general uses or purposes for your teas. One would be to break down what is already there, creating nutrition for the plant. Uh, two would be to grow the plant and produce some type of growth hormone there. And three would be some type of resistance um, and or preventative measure in that uh, you'd be fighting off the bad guys, if you will. So let's say that we started with a new clone, right? What would be your tea of choice for a new transplant into a sterile medium? Um, I, I tend to lean more towards the fungal dominant first. Why is that? Um, so a lot of, if you're looking at the roots of a plant underneath a microscope, you have the, the, the main, you know, in a lot of ways it mimics what you'd see above ground. So you have, you know, kind of that main branch coming off and then there'll be uh, the root hairs. Um, and if you look at it closer, what you see is it actually is kind of deceptive, like in a lot of ways, your, your skin. So you, we have hair coming off of our skin, but we also have holes in our skin in the form of pores where um, the, there are spaces that are actually going inside as well. So roots have those and what ends up happening with a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, 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 the fungus that we introduce to this is that they have a, um, that, that, that they have a very close relationship with the plant and that they will actually plug into those pores and then they themselves will snake out, spiderweb out into the soil and actually extend the surface area or, or multiply the surface area of um, that that plant is able to cover. So a plant root in and of itself or just like me standing here, I can only reach out and touch what's immediately around me. If I am, you know, Spider-Man with a web slinger, she throwing out something, well, I can grab something from across the room. And that's how the fungal hyphae act when they're in a direct relationship with the plant. So for early growth, um, for, for establishing that root system and, and getting it as strong as, as strong as possible, as fast as possible, and giving it immediate, immediate access to as much of that surface area as possible, I tend to, to want to lean towards fungal dominant early. Mm -hmm. So as the plant starts to get established and is able to kind of absorb what's immediately available in whatever soil mix that you're using, then it starts to lean towards the breakdown of the soil, which although the, the, uh, the, the fungal growth definitely has a big role to play in that as well, but a lot of the, the I guess, a little more diverse side of that is really in, in the biology, is, is in the, the, uh, the bacteria. Um, so the, the bacteria are a lot of the ones that create different hormones, create amino acids. Um, the, the, the lactobacillus and bacillus will have a, a, a a little bit more uh, active or faster role in, in breaking things down, especially when you combine them all. Um, but they can also occupy a lot of that same space that the fungus would like to be occupying. So the fungal growth tends to happen a little bit slower. The bacterial growth can happen relatively quickly. Um, and so that's the reason for kind of establishing the, the uh, get, getting the, the fungal colonies established first and then starting to transition into the into the bacterial more bacterial dominant and then as you get into late flower there are all kinds of specific um, species that are um, producing a lot of those growth hormones and uh, or there are you know some of them that will specifically break down certain things in the soil faster so early on we're more interested in, in nitrogen uh, Later on, you know, it goes from basically goes from N from from N to P to K mm -hmm. in terms of our focus of uh, and the plant's life cycle. So you can kind of you can kind of tailor that a little bit with the biology as well. Right on. So I know that for me, you know, it, I have the, the similar mind frame in that you know the fungal colonies get them developed first, and then the bacteria can break down those things like you're mentioning green sand and montremolite -like clay and these very mineral rich, trace element rich compounds that are not readily available to the plant. So the bacteria that produce amino acids and enzymes help the plant to make that bioavailable. 
And then I know for me that towards the end of the life cycle, especially in flowering cannabis plants, um, you run into a lot of the problems towards the end. And being an organic cultivator um, and a conscious cultivator, it doesn't allow me to put any sprays on my plants or do any of that topical preventative measures. Um, so what would you utilize? Like what are some strains you'd utilize, say towards the end to fight off a fusarium or pythium or botrytis, you know, uh, um, pressure? There are 50 different species that you'll find in a lot of the hydrostore mixes. If you actually take any of those names written on the back of them and look them up online, you'll see what kind of effects they have. And, and a lot of them are kind of on both sides, but they're, they're participating in, in or assisting with the breakdown of the soil, but they're also, um, they're, they're also antagonistic to any sort of pathogens in the soil. But then there are some that are more aggressive than others. Um, so Streptomyces, Actinovate, uh, it's Actinovate, yeah. yeah. Streptomyces was sold as Actinovate is one that, that a lot of people use and it can be also used as a foliar, although I think it's soil borne naturally, mm -hmm. it comes from the soil. Uh, it can also be sprayed as a foliar. Um, something like that is a, is a good one to start adding into the teas as you get a little bit later, later on down the road. Yeah. Um, um, I have a question for you on that on the Streptomyces. I've heard that um, you know, one of the reasons why you wouldn't want to use the streptomyces early on as, say, a preventative. Like, why wouldn't you get streptomyces in there right off the bat so that that stuff can't come in, in there, the first place? There are other species better suited to that that are not going to actually attack the fungal growth in the soil that you do want. And streptomyces, and again, I'm not a biologist, but my understanding of streptomyces is that it is a pretty aggressive, um, pretty aggressive organism when it comes to attacking uh, different funguses and things like that and it doesn't necessarily differentiate you know there's going to be some differentiated some some of their preferred foods versus things that they wouldn't necessarily prefer or wouldn't necessarily want to bother with but um, that they are aggressive enough that they can uh, that they can have a little bit of an effect on the, the fungal growth in the soil that we do want and I don't necessarily know that to be true that's more of an intuitive um, you know something that I think was more intuitive for me in terms of my practice, but uh, I didn't necessarily want to use those things um, right off the bat, just because you don't necessarily have to. But then, as you get later on down the road, and you you know, and the plants start, especially as the plants start to reach the end of their life cycle, and they start to get weaker, um, they are then subject to any of these things. A lot of them are systemic, exist in nature anyway. You know, like uh, here where we are, I think they say that there's 20 percent of 20% of the dust in the air is actually active mold spores and things like that. So these things all exist in the environment anyway. It's not necessarily that you need to have a plant that's contaminated and then come and combine that with the fact that a lot of the issues that we have are systemic and they actually came from, you know, they've, they've been with the plant for a very long time. Uh, that's the stage of life where those things will start to uh, start to gain a little bit more of a foothold now that the plant's weaker and they, they have kind of a, a, an avenue of attack. Um, so as it gets later on, then I'll start transitioning from, start transitioning more into those things that are really going to be uh, antagonistic to the pathogens, uh, and that's to, to where by the end of the life cycle, that's really all you're trying to put in there because the the plant is, it's got it's you know it, it's got the majority of its nutri the nutrients that it's going to be using, either in the stored form of you know the measuring bricks levels, things like that. It's part of building up the bricks. And so the middle stage of using a lot of those type of bacteria um, uh, will, will help to increase the bricks levels. And then th that's a lot of the stored energy for the plant. And as you get down to the last bit of the life cycle, and uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is, is kind of already set in motion. You're not necessarily as dependent, especially if you're supplementing foods, soluble foods, like we do a lot of times in late flower. Um, you know, you're, you're supplementing, like I said, from N to P to K, depending on where you are in the life cycle. And as you transition from P to K and you get into the end of the life cycle, um, you know, we're, we're using bloom boosters and we're, we're feeding them stuff that's soluble, which is also going to disrupt the biology in the soil. Um, prior to, I guess, my personal approach early on for a lot of this stuff is that you don't want to feed them heavily ever, really. I, I don't lean towards that ever to, you know, just pump full of steroids because that's just that's not not how i would want to do everything it for myself in moderation, right? <laughs> everything in moderation um, 
and then, and then as they get to the later part of their life cycle, it just it, to me it seems much more, um, uh, much more uh, realistic, or, or my intuition I guess then says to, okay, now we've gotten pretty close to the end of the road. Let's make sure we don't have any problems and concentrate really on um, on the things that that are either going to help the plant finish, assuming that it already has access to everything else that it wants. Um, either by supplemental feeding, because you know, in the end of flower, we're always supplemental feeding on some level. Um, uh, so then, then the teas become more targeted towards pest suppression, disease, the disease suppression, things like that. Uh, and then you can shift that at any point in time too, if you're having, uh, you know, if you're having specific issues that you want to target. Um, okay. you know, so, so you have, you have fungus gnats, or you have uh, root aphids, or you know things like that. Then. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily add, like uh, Bavaria bassiana is one that I use for some of that stuff. I wouldn't necessarily add that to any tea unless I was interested in making sure that I'm not gonna end up with a fungus gnat explosion or root aphids taking off or anything like that. Then I would, so later on in the process, I start to add things like that more to the tea. So I'll add more of the Streptomyces, I'll add more of the Bavaria bassiana. Um, Subtilis is really a good one for the whole process. That one also is, is, is an antagonist of a lot of pathogens. Yeah. So those would be kind of the three general T's for me. It would be first fungal dominant and then transitioning into something that's a little bit more bacterial focused where you have some of those um, it, and anything that's producing like a, like a plant growth hormone. Um, and then towards the end, it's just making sure that we cross the finish line uh, you know, in, in, in a strong way. And, uh, not, not get all the way to the finish line and then, oh, 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 no, I can't move. Yeah, totally. So, so one, one peanut gallery question. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned fungus. Uh, do you think a lot of people who brew tea just sort of solely focus on bacteria? Um, and sort of forget about the, or don't think about the importance of fungus? My experience with the majority of people that are using teas, or a lot of people that I speak to using teas, is that the understanding of the difference between a fungal dominant tea and a bacterial dominant tea and what it takes to achieve those two things is not necessarily common knowledge. In life. It requires a little more investigation. Um, and uh, uh, so I guess in a lot of cases, it just seems like a lack of, a lack of un understanding of you know, okay, this is what I'm trying to do. This is why, and this is how I achieve it. Versus, I've heard fun, I've heard compost teas work really well, and so I'm going to buy these products and I'm going to combine them in this rate that I found online, and I'm going to create a compost tea and I'm going to feed it to my plants. But the number of people that are doing it and not able to actually determine anything about their tea other than the fact that it's brown and smells the way that they say it's supposed to smell if you don't have a, a microscope to look at it and actually see those life forms and have I produced a bunch of fungal hyphae or have I produced a bunch of bacteria and um, so is that yeah so I, I think that in, in my discussions with a lot of people and a lot of the questions that I feel is um, that it, it takes a bit more sophistication and an expensive microscope that you utilize to look at your T's and see where your teas are and if the balance is where it needs to be and most people don't have access to that and don't have the knowledge of that but there are plenty of good recipes out there for general teas like you were saying bacillus subtilis is a good overall it kind of works for everything and it's pretty easy to find in bagged mixes and then to multiply in a five gallon bucket with an air stone so um, in general a lot of the tea recipes come out as a general overall tea um, but when you get into production as large and specific as we do here, then you need to know exactly what's going into your tea and what's coming out of your tea um, so you know when to use it and if your tea is ripe or not. 